I'm going to talk about the implementation of ICH E16 guidelines. What well, the guideline itself? Well, uh, this is about the uh, CTD format for the biomarkers uh, for the new uh, drug development. But rather than talking about it for an hour, I'm going to talk about what the biomarkers are, why biomarkers are needed, and also how we can do the classification and what the validation processes are. And uh, when we are describing in the CTD format how to do that, that's what I'm going to be covering. And about the drug response, uh, this is very pharmacological, but this is my major. And in the new drug development, uh, as the law says, is to look at pharmacology, PK, and PD of drugs to see uh, the, uh, the clinical uh, effects. And so uh, the biomarkers are all related to uh, the drug response. And so how the, uh, the response uh, occurs and where there is a variability. And so you, because of the variability, that's why you need the biomarkers, why the, uh, whether the drug works, whether there are side effects, that is why uh, biomarkers are needed. And so all the drugs act like this, whether it's injectable, whether it's uh, taken orally, they all need to be administrated. And they are to be taken into the whole body. While there are some drugs that work locally, then in that case, we can talk about the local PK. But uh, pharmacokinetics, this is about the movement of drugs. Uh, the drug is not moving uh, outside the body. It's more of how it comes into the body and goes out of the body. And this is a, a plays a very important role in the drug response. And also in the development of drugs, depending on the uh, PK, uh, the dosage uh, may be different. And once the drug comes in, I mean, is that the end? Where well, they have to go to uh, the target tissues and organs and have the uh, appropriate uh, effect. And that's what how pharmacodynamics is about. And so through PK and PD, we are able to see uh, the clinical effects. And not all the clinical effects are positive. Um, not all, I mean, all, excuse me, all the drugs do uh, have some sort of uh, side effects. And so the drugs have to be developed in order to have minimal uh, side effects or the complications. And also there has to be risk benefit assessment. If the benefit is larger than risk, the drug may be used if as long as the drug is uh, efficacy, uh, is effective. And so all drugs uh, have both the uh, effects as well as uh, side effects. And the effects as well as side effects occur as a result of uh, PK and PD. And if it's a side effect on target, then uh, it would have the same uh, PK and PD mechanism as effects, but uh, it's because the, it's more more uh, it's excessively effective. But if there is an you know off target uh, drug adverse event, then uh, PK would be the similar, but there is. Uh, but it's working on another uh, tar uh, tissue or the organ that not anticipated. And so uh, the PKPD uh, interrelationship, uh, or uh, the correlation is what's impacting or deciding the, uh, the effectiveness. And so uh, the biomarkers do not represent the clinical effects uh, directly. It would be best if it could do that. If not, then we have to look at the F, uh, PD uh, indicators. And if we don't have that, then we will have to look at uh, PK uh, uh, indicators. If there's too much exposure to drugs, if the, uh, there is going to be, uh, that's going to be determining and the clinical effects. So all drugs. So dosage, PK, and PD, uh, 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 the relationship is what impacts the clinical effect. And so uh, so in phase one and phase two A, we are uh, looking at uh, dosing PK, uh, or that's uh, P, uh, PD. And so as but uh, uh, two, three, uh, uh, phase three B, it's uh, going to be also looking at the clinical effects. And so exploration is done as I have circled here, and the confirmation is done in the, the latter circle that I have drawn here. And so in that process, we have identified and utilized different uh, biomarkers. And so uh, PK is about absorption. 
and about uh, distribution and metabolization. And uh, PD is about uh, secretion and metabolization as well. And but will the response be the same for everyone? The information they get from the clinical trials are about the average uh, patient population. So the drugs that we uh, develop here in Korea are approved based on the information on average patients. And same for the uh, global clinical trials. So based on the average values, approvals are provided. And so the drug may work and, and not have any uh, side effect. Well, uh, for the average patient, uh, the, but it may not work for some patients and there can be uh, reasons. Uh, it could be of insufficient exposure or it could be uh, some uh, changes in and the receptors that the person has and also some people at the same uh, dosage would have a, a too excessive of exposure and so if it, there's too much exposure then there would be higher incidence of AES and so and at the same concentration, some people would have a good response, but people here in this uh, that I've circled here would have less effectiveness. And so there could be so many uh, variabilities. And so biomarkers are important, not just in terms of development, but also in terms of utilization of drugs to see the risk because, uh, and that is determined by the responsiveness to the drugs. And those uh, responsiveness can be uh, looked at through uh, biomarkers. There are different causes of variabilities. It could be a gender, it could be a weight for the uzopidem uh, here in Korea. Uh, the approval approved a dosage is half the Western approved dosage here in Korea. And so uh, for women, the Zolpidem approved dosage is uh, half of what the uh, So that was, it says that effectiveness could be different depending on, on gender. That's an example. And in the ICT uh, certain guideline, it's about the genomics of uh, biomarkers. And so uh, this is, so these intrinsic uh, reasons could uh, determine and the variabilities. And in terms of oncology, the targeting of oncology or the tumors would uh, ha be the causes for different uh, variabilities. And so when we're looking at at the biomarkers, we would look at uh, drug metabolizing enzymes and drug and transporters. And so a mutation in metabolizing enzymes and, and transporters will have different uh, the uh, absorption, metabolization, and uh, uh, this uh, distribution or the excretion. And that would have a different uh, 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 side effect or complication uh, profiles. And also it could be non-small lung uh, cell. And so depending on the receptors, uh, the effective, uh, the first line therapy would be different. So this is all determined by uh, drug targets. And so it, the a drug has to bind to a certain uh, receptor, but it, uh, you know, whether that uh, binding effect is or, or there or not will determine the effectiveness. And also the BV uh, virus, there are five different genotypes and depending on the type, there will be different drug response. And uh, genotype one, two are common in Asia. In Italy, uh, genotype five is also very common. And the drug, uh, there are not that many drugs that are currently being developed that is effective on uh, genotype five. For so Italian patients, uh, for a certain drug, there will be less uh, drug response. And there is a biomarker involved here. So in terms of uh, PK, drug met uh, metallizing uh, enzyme, uh, which is related to warfarin, 
and so 2C9 and 2C19 uh, mutations will bring up a different drug uh, response. So they can be a genetic biomarker. As a EGF uh, mutation will will be biomarkers in terms of PD and HVB. And so the, we have to look at different virus types and the subtypes to see whether they can be used as biomarkers. And so in clinical trials, in, so we uh, the, these biomarkers can be used as inclusion exclusion uh, criteria. So our drug is uh, developed for genotype one and two, for instance, and uh, if there's no genotype inclusion exclusion here, and so if there's a lot of genotype has re been enrolled, then this drug is not going to have good outcome because the population itself is not as susceptible to this drug. And so that is why this can be used as a, uh, inclusion exclusion criteria, as well as a drug effectiveness uh, evaluation uh, criteria. And also biomarkers can also be used in order to uh, sub uh, population analysis. And so, and for uh, if that uh, subpopulation um, could be, you know, to have a drug from that subpopulation, uh, it could be very competitive. And so you, then you could go for that uh, subpopulation approval. But if the subpopulation is too small and therefore not economical, then you would not be uh, utilizing that particular uh, biomarker. And so I was too long on their very early uh, pages. And so other uh, the texts in the back, you can just read them. So in the past, we had the same dosage for everyone. And so depending on the efficacy on people, then we would change to other drugs. By using the biomarkers, we know, you know who will have good response. And if we think that somebody is uh, going to be experiencing toxicity, of course, uh, depending on that biomarker, we are going to be giving it different uh, drugs. So this is what a personalized medicine is about. Well, uh, uh, President Barack Obama is the person who has made a personalized medicine um, popular. So this is looking at you know, maximizing efficacy and minimizing uh, AE for patients. And that is what a personalized uh, medicine is about. And as I said, here we're talking about the average population. Uh, for instance, a patient has a liver or kidney a disorder or is pregnant. And even if the same person, uh, this person uh, has called, therefore has take, uh, to take an antibiotics and also has a concomitant drug that this person is taking. And for the clinical uh, trials, you have just the people that are only taking that uh, clinical trial trial drug, and but uh, so that uh, a clinical trial drug is not going to be working uh, for uh, these different types of patients or the patients in diff uh, under different conditions. So that is why we need uh, biomarkers. And in the past, we looked at clinical effects and then adjusted uh, doses or uh, uh, changed uh, drugs. And so drugs, so you give a drug to a patient, if it doesn't work, then after three, four days, you would change to another drug. So you've taken a Tylenol, but you still have headaches. Then you would take one more or you would take another drug and uh, the Tylenol is so not very likely to cause serious uh, hepatotoxicity. So Tylenol, you know, that sort of drug, it's not an issue. However, but what if, what if you have a cancer and you have to take this uh, 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 treatment? Then here uh, you cannot and try and see what happens. And that is why a PK, a PD, are utilized in order to forecast uh, efficacy. And that's what uh, war, how the warfarin works. So before warfarin is administered, drug testing, uh, excuse me, blood testing is done. And so uh, we do a PTR assessment. And uh, PTINR, excuse me. And this is a validated uh, biomarker that we use. 
However, when we did not have this biomarker, what did we do? We just uh, saw the patient, and and then if there are bruises, then we would reduce, uh, uh, you know, or increase the drugs. And so traditional methods had limitation, but with the PT and IR, you can do better uh, modulation or adjustments. And so for people who do need to reduce uh, the dosage, and then and and you know because they have a certain mutations and so in uh, some hospitals they would uh, do you know if the patient has to take the warfarin they would do the uh, necessary genetic analysis and decide on the dosage a uh, dosage based on the genotypes the warfarin uh, dosing.com there you put in your height weight uh, uh, ethnic group and as well as you know gender types and it tells you the initial uh, dosage and that's quite different what's on the label and 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 our target INR is about two and three and that would be within on that range and that is how we uh, decide on the appropriate dosage nowadays. And, and the biomarkers has to be developed in line with the uh, drug development to be able to do uh, this sort of work. Uh, so you know, how many have been approved by the EMA or the FDA? That's not really important because there are not that many biomarkers that have been uh, within uh, the uh, approval uh, range. And so, so there are a lot of comparable uh, diagnoses that have done when Herceptin was first developed and HER2 uh, diagnostics, diagnostics was only used by Roche and, and Roche and Roche uh, Diagnostics, well, these are two different companies. Anyway, they were selling the drugs as well as the diagnostic uh, diagnostics. And anyway, uh, what's really important is that uh, for these biomarkers to be established, there have to be many, many uh, patients clinically. And so there have to be many clinical cases and those drugs have already have uh, the patent and and they have already, uh, even if the uh, the biomarkers are proven, and they uh, the biomarkers will be not reflected in the labels because the and uh, the data expired, uh, the data has been already expired, and the patent has also expired in some cases, and so the biomarkers are not included in the lab uh, labels, and and there is a uh, uh, the DPWG and a CPIC have come up uh, with the uh, guidelines and so they say that uh, there are 66 of uh, drugs are with these uh, biomarkers are said to be uh, effective and so as of early this year there are about 60 of such uh, drugs I mean that I mean that is according to the CPIC guidelines and there is of uh, the many different types of biomarkers, as I said, and these uh, biomarkers are uh, a uh, surrogate indicators for the efficacy in others. And FDA is, are defining biomarkers as of uh, endpoints and other tools. So biomarkers could be endpoints as well as tools. And uh, it defines biomarkers as something that is measured as an indicator of normal biological processes or pathogenic processes or responses to exposure or intervention, including a therapeutic interventions. And, and so they are used at their many different types of so given molecular, histologic and radiographic and physiologic uh, biomarkers and uh, molecular and these uh, four different types of uh, biomarkers are can be uh, determined based on uh, the blood glucose, tumor grade, tumor size, and blood pressure. And there are different categories of biomarkers. There are susceptibility risk biomarkers, and these are uh, the uh, disease susceptibility and risk. And there's also uh, diagnostic uh, biomarkers. Inclusion, so this is all about inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then, and also about the indication. 
of the drugs after the approval. And there is the monitoring biomarker, prognostic and predictive uh, biomarkers. And, and there's the pharmacodynamic and response biomarkers. And these are the uh, surrogate endpoints. And then there's the uh, safety uh, biomarker. I mean, safety could also be a surrogate uh, biomarker. And because uh, they do, rep uh, this uh, biomarker represents uh, safety and uh, excuse me, efficacy and uh, side effects. And so now, uh, well, there are clear definitions of different biomarkers, but when they are used in clinically, well, uh, the, it's the, the categorization or the classifications of these different biomarkers are not so clear cut. So some people uh, may have, you know, for some people, you know, there could be a, a, a bi a biomarker that could be diagnostic as well as, for instance, a susceptibility. I know it's very confusing, and my students are always very confused, and they want to be able to uh, uh, give the right answer when taking the test, which means they want to have clear answers when in, to, in terms of biomarkers. But anyway. There are these all these biomarkers. Uh, they are not really a uh, clear cut in terms of. But let me just say that there are seven different purposes that biomarkers are utilized. Let me uh, uh, and also for the susceptibility and risk biomarkers, and this indicates the potential uh, for developing a disease. BRCA one two. Uh, it could be uh, the uh, efficacy biomarker as well. But BRCA1, 2 are famous as risk biomarkers. This uh, Angelina Jolly is the person that made uh, these genes uh, famous uh, because she had uh, these uh, biomarkers and she decided to go for surgery to remove uh, the uh, ovaries and uh, breasts. And then there's also uh, the HPV, uh, HPV, which causes a uh, cervical cancers. And so there are very clear uh, uh, genotypes defined uh, for uh, this uh, the, uh, drug or for this uh, biomarkers. And so these are very important, um, in particular when trying to develop uh, vaccines. And so this is an excellent uh, biomarker uh, for developing uh, vaccines. And when we're going to make a, for instance, cervical cancer a vaccine, then uh, we will see uh, the effectiveness of prevention uh, for uh, these uh, viruses. And to do that, we could use uh, this biomarker. And about diagnostic biomarker, this is to detect or confirm presence of a disease. And HbA1c, well, this is one that we can use to diagnose type 1 or type 2 uh, diabetes. And so we because this uh, will tell us uh, what a person's uh, glucose level has been uh, for the past uh, three months. And also for the assessment of the efficacy of drugs, what do you look at? You also look at HB816. So this is a validated surrogate uh, uh, endpoint. And then on oh, this is a cystic fibrosis, where I'm not going to go into the de uh, these uh, ones. And for uh, the lymphoma, uh, the B cells would be important. And so. So B cell, T cell, uh, genotype, uh, profiling would be, uh, be are also well known uh, diagnostic biomarkers. And monitoring biomarkers are used to assess a status of a disease. And uh, HCV or DNA or the RNA levels could be uh, good examples. And whether you have you know, envelope antigens or the surface antigens, well, the, I mean, those are, uh, I mean, they could also be diagnostic uh, biomarkers, but also if you look at the activity uh, active level, and so if these are viruses or, so by looking at the monitoring uh, biomarker, we can see the status of a disease and HCV or it's HBV. So we, HBV will be looking at the DNA level with the HCV, we'll be looking at RNA level. And so when it goes to the DNA level, we will provide a treatment and if it works, and then uh, there could potentially be a, a 
and to the drugs as you uh, to treatments, excuse me. And then there is the uh, prognostic uh, biomarker. This is related to uh, looking at likelihood of a clinical event, a disease of recurrence or progression. And BRCA1 and 2 are the most well known uh, prognostic uh, biomarkers. And these are biomarkers mostly for to see whether there will be a recurrence of uh, breast cancer, but this could also, but BRCA1 could also be a susceptible of uh, biomarkers. And then there is the uh, predictive uh, biomarker, and this is used to identify individuals who are more likely than others uh, to, you know, that would have more uh, effect uh, from exposure to a uh, medicinal uh, product. And uh, the BRCA one two would fall into uh, this uh, category, and also. Uh, for the human uh, leukocyte antigen LE, uh, HLA B or five seven O one is a biomarker that can uh, anticipate help to anticipate uh, side effects. And then there's the response of biomarker, which is a biological response with the potentially beneficial or harmful uh, 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 responses. And this would be on target side effects, and that can be expressed by a response uh, biomarker. And so this is somewhat also related to safety uh, biomarker. Marker. And response biomarker is the most important biomarker when we do a new drug uh, development because safe safety and efficacy can be, be assessed with these, uh, this biomarker. And the, the response uh, biomarker is also sometimes looked at as a surrogate endpoint. So with the PKPD uh, clinic effect, there's a correlation bit, uh, among these three. And so the surrogate endpoint is the one that can represent the clinical uh, effect. That's what we call as a surrogate uh, endpoint. When developing diabetic drugs, and HA1BC is the surrogate endpoint. And about the effects of so uh, the diabetic drug, what how what's its role? What does it do? Does anybody know? I think everyone's very confused here. So the the blood uh, BP drug, what I mean, what it's what is its objective? Is it to lower the BP, or is is it to ensure a person has a long life uh, by controlling the BP? Well, the diabetic drug is the objective of is to enable a person to control uh, the glucose so that the person will be able to live out uh, his or her uh, f uh, predetermined or, or his or uh, lifetime it will be able to live uh, until you know till uh, until anticipated or expected uh, age and so I would have 1,000 patients, but 90% on the drug was able to live to the expected or the anticipated uh, lifespan. So that is the objective of a drug. Same, uh, this is same for the diabetic drugs as well BP drugs, and the cancer drugs. We look at the five-year survival and the overall of uh, uh, survival, and so now the. Uh, with the uh, cancer drugs, the five year as well OS have all improved. And so, whether a person is able to live to the expected uh, lifespan is uh, the purpose of any drug. And uh, we have a surrogate endpoint that's going to uh, tell us whether a person will be able to live to the expected uh, lifespan, have an expected lifespan uh, with the drug, uh, with the help of the drug without a major uh, complication. So that is the principle. However, we are not able to do that. That is why we need uh, uh, such uh, a surrogate. And for diabetics, it's the H1. Uh, that is what uh, HbA1c helps. And so it's FHbA1c 
falls like this, then uh, we do not have to follow up this person for 20, 30 years because we know this person is going to eat, to live till the expected lifespan. And so that is uh, the well known uh, surrogate uh, end point. For diabetics, well, we do have a very uh, clear uh, surrogate. For other drugs, we do not have such a uh, surrogate end point especially for the rare uh, disease and for the real disease, I mean, we would not be able to follow up a patient until the patient uh, passes away. And so we, so we look at uh, biomarkers. Then we will see whether the drug will be effective or whether there will be uh, complications. And that is the pharmacodynamic biomarker. I mean, they are response biomarkers. But uh, but depending on the evidence level, uh, we have uh, the different uh, biomarkers, and we have a uh, have evaluated uh, surrogate uh, a biomarker as well as a reasonably uh, validated uh, biomarker, and then we would also have a candidate uh, biomarker. And so please uh, read uh, through uh, the presentation step later on. And as for the uh, pharmacodynamic biomarkers, uh, one example of such a biomarker is the of uh, the uh, uh, fluoroestradiol F18 uh, level level uh, related biomarker as well as a uh, phospho AK. T uh, levels, and these are a uh, surrogate endpoint points. Uh, for, as I said, for the diabetes, the HA1BC, and so uh, it's a very well uh, validated uh, uh, surrogates or indicators. And also, uh, the six months outcome uh, can be also be anticipated with such a surrogate uh, endpoints. And so uh, these are uh, here, as you can see, are the most well-known surrogate endpoints. So FDA has a list of such a surrogate endpoints. They have, for instance, what's called adult surrogate uh, endpoints. Uh, here they do not have the candidate uh, endpoints, but or I am showing you this because the, the clinical uh, trials need to identify these uh, biomarkers from the very early uh, stage of, uh, clinical, uh, of the, the, these of clinical trials. And when uh, at phase two, uh, the clinical trials need to see uh, the changes in terms of biomarkers in order to decide on the uh, number of sample or the size of the sample at uh, phase three. And then there's also the safety of biomarker. This is something that would indicate the likelihood and presence and extent of toxicity as an adverse uh, effect. And so the most well known as such a biomarker is the, uh, the QTCs, as well as the uh, hepatic uh, aminotransferases and, uh, and bilirubins. And the QTCs, well, well, I have only 15 minutes to go, and so I'll be quicker with the presentation. And as for the biomarker qualifications, according to the FDA, well, we'll uh, be uh, asking uh, the FDA uh, to look at this, because the FDA does not have the responsibility of developing such biomarkers. And so the investigators will be proposing the biomarkers, and the pharmaceutical companies will be, you know, for the company diagnosis purpose, will be suggesting um, the biomarkers. And so uh, they have to send a letter of intent related to biomarkers to FDA, and then we'll also have to submit the qualification and plans, and the whether there will be in vitro studies, and because uh, the uh, biomarkers would also need the uh, CMCs because they can be used for the diagnostic purposes, and so how they are going to be creating the data using you know uh, the biomarkers, and so such uh, things will be included in the plans, and if the FDA uh, says okay, and then. Uh, they will be coming with the data, and the data will then be submitted to the FDA to be reviewed. 
And so the LOI is very important. And the context of use uh, is the most important component of the letter of intent. And then uh, in the second stage, there has to be submission of the quality plan. And then in uh, stage three, a full qualification package have to be submitted to in order to get the approval. So what exactly is the context of use? This is a concise description of the biomarker specified use in the uh, drug development. And uh, these are uh, and so the, there has to be a best a biomarker category as well as a biomarkers intended use in uh, an, an drug development. And so uh, the biomarker category, as I said, as well as the intended use need to be included. And they will, whether this is going to be used for the uh, inclusion exclusion criteria or for a dosage a decision. Uh, so uh, the uh, the clinical trial intended use for the clinical trials have to be included in this context of use. So it's the combination of the two. That is uh, the how, and that is the uh, uh, the combination of the the category as well as the uh, intended use in drug development. So I've told you about uh, seven different um, biomarker categories. So you have to choose one of the seven, and then uh, you have to uh, give. Ex uh, you have to also describe what the intended use of uh, the biomarker that you are trying to develop is, and so. And oh, so you have you have to able to say uh, this biomarker is good for the safety assessment, but then you have to also explain how uh, such uh, the biomarker can be used. And there are uh, these uh, qualified uh, biomarkers, and there are about seven or eight uh, different uh, qualified biomarkers uh, by uh, the FDA and uh, these are all uh, investigator uh, proposed and so these are uh, biomarkers that can be used not just for the clinical trials but also in the real world uh, clinical uh, settings. And as for the ICH E16 guideline, or well, it's uh, by uh, it's about biomarkers related to drug or biotechnology product development and context structure and format of a qualification of submission. So the genetic uh, biomarkers to, uh, in, to be used in the new drug development, uh, you have to get the approval from the regulatory authority, and it has to be done according to the format. Uh, to a certain format, and that is the uh, the format that is uh, described in uh, ICH E16 guideline, and uh, this is also uh, related to ICH E15, which is about the definitions for the genomics biomarkers as well as the pharmacogenomics, uh, pharmacogenetics, uh, and the genomic data and the sample coding and um, categories, and and so. I was going to review the uh, E15, but then I thought that was uh, would be unnecessary, and so here I'm only going to be talking about E16 and a CTD format. I know that you have a lecture on CTD format. You know that there is packet one, two, three, and four, and unless you have actually done it yourself, it's quite difficult to understand what that those different types of CTD means. Same with uh, the E16 guidelines. You have to know what these guide uh, biomarkers are and and how these biomarkers can be uh, utilized in the new uh, drug development. That is why I've talked so long about the biomarkers. Anyway, the objective you can read them at your leisure, and this is the uh, general. Uh, principles. And the, uh, the module one is about the regional administrative information. And then uh, this is the module two, uh, which is the uh, about the overall summary. Uh, that, and this would include a non-clinical overview, clinical uh, as well non-clinical summary and the clinical overview, clinical summary, as well as quality overall uh, summary. And module three is about uh, quality. What's the, the format is about the drugs. If there is and uh, I mean, you don't need uh, the biomarker uh, specific uh, data, so you don't need the CMC. So so you can just skip uh, module three, and module four is about the non-clinical study reports, and the module five is about the clinical study reports. 
And uh, so in section one, there's about uh, it's about the regional administrative information, and uh, section two, it's about the summaries, and the, the, it will in summaries would include biomarker qualification overview, which would include introduction context of use, summary of methodology and results, and uh, conclusion, and then uh, there's the overall. Uh, uh, summaries of the following, uh, which uh, such as the analytical assay data, non-clinical biomarker data, and the clinical uh, biomarker uh, data. Uh, what's uh, really important is that uh, you have the uh, or overall uh, qualification uh, and data. And in section three, this is about quality uh, report. Here it says if applicable. And uh, the, if the uh, and this is about structural manufacturing quality characteristics of investigational drugs, and uh, for uh, the uh, biomarker uh, qualification uh, studies, and section four and section five are uh, non-clinical reports and clinical reports respectively. And now let's look at the biomarker uh, qualification overview. In the introduction, there has to be uh, a summary of key characteristics of biomarkers. What the uh, strengths are, what the limitations are, and whether it's a single or a composite biomarker, and also uh, what uh, the objective and design of the study supporting its use are. And what's most important is the context of use. There are three different levels. There could be general context of use, there's a specific use, and there could be a critical uh, parameters. There are times when the critical parameters exist or not. Uh, so. If you want to describe, you know, if it is below or above certain number, then you would include it as clinical uh, parameters. And as for the general area, it could be about non-clinical or clinical biomarker, uh, biomark whether what the pharmacology is, what the uh, toxicology efficacy and safety and disease are. And about the specific biomarker using, uh, whether it's used for the patient uh, selection, uh, whether it's used for the assessment of disease state or prognosis, whether it's used for the assessment of mechanism of action, or used uh, for the dose optimization, or is, uh, is used uh, to uh, minimize the toxicity or to maximize uh, efficacy or to uh, monitor drug response. And then there is the critical parameter of context of use, which uh, that is so. And in this, uh, for a, a certain a clinical trials, well, you set a, a specifications uh, to uh, uh, make assessment. And there are, are here are some examples, an uh, mRNA level of a kidney injury uh, molecule one, which is a KIM one, and the clostrin CLU. These are uh, genomic biomarkers of a drug or a biotechnology induced acute renal tubular toxicity in rat uh, toxicology studies. And this is a biomarker that is already used widely in a clinical uh, setting. And uh, it's used widely in the clinical setting, but they are not yet validated enough or qualified enough to be used in the clinical trials. And, uh, but uh, it is a biomarker that has been uh, been uh, validated for the non-clinical safety and toxicology. And as for the specified micro use, it's used for the assessment of mechanism of toxicity and dose optimization uh, that is NOEL in animal uh, models. And, and so that's the specific biomarker use and how to use uh, use it. Well, it could be drug or by uh, technology product specific use. No, as for the say uh, specifications, it's at the mRNA level. What it, what is it targeting? Uh, what it would be a uh, kidney? And as the species that it has been uh, proven in, it could be the rat. So in rats, in order to identify the no IL. Uh, this is a biomarker that has been validated for uh, to identify kidney uh, toxicity. And as for the CYP2C9 in the warfarin, and uh, this is for the genetic uh, polymorphism, and there could be a difference in terms of drug A exposure between PM. 
uh, PMs and EMs. And the general area would be a clinical pharmacology and drug metabolism and safety. And the, the specific biomarker use is patient and clinical trial uh, subject selection. And uh, in terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria, and also for a dose optimization in individual patients, and also for predicting adverse uh, reactions and risk of minimization. This are what I uh, described in the earlier part of uh, my talk. And as for the critical parameters of context of use, it, in terms of drug or the biotechnology product specific use, is good drug A, and as I say, specification will be genotyping, and the species will be Homo sapiens, which means people. And then uh, lastly, uh, for the HLAB 1502, it's a in, it's to use uh, for the increased risk to look at uh, the bi uh, the biomarkers for the increased risk of the development of Stevens Johnson syndrome following administration of drug B in Han and Chinese. So the general area would be clinical safety, and the specific biomarker would be uh, the patient selection and predict the safety mechanism of adverse reaction and toxicity. And the uh, critical parameters for the context use would be drug B, as well for the genotyping. And, um, and HLA B51502 uh, mutation is very important uh, for a uh, development of uh, CNS uh, drugs. And so, in when uh, and so when you uh, during the drug development, when there's a mortality, that's a big issue. And for uh, if, it, uh, but if for the CNS drug. I mean, this is not to treat a uh, disease, you know, that will uh, end in uh, mortality right away. Anyway, uh, so, and the uh, C specification is for the genotyping, the species, the Homo sapiens, and when the demographic, uh, including ancestries or geographic origins, uh, it will be for the Han uh, Chinese. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, but uh, HLA-B1502, well, when it's used for biomarker in person, this is most useful for uh, the, uh, uh, the ethnic group of Han Chinese. And this would be the end of my presentation.